I've already been accused by Hirka this morning of changing the title of my presentation and therefore getting into this conference b b fraudulently. Um, I didn't actually notice I changed it um, from XML on the browser to XSLT. I guess that reflects the fact that my ambition reduced slightly from <laughs> submitting the, 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 the talk to actually delivering it. Um, I'm going to stretch my, um, the, the, the patience of, of, of the, co the program committee as well because um, one thing that they're very insistent on when soliciting um, papers for a conference like this is, 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 is that you mustn't give a sales presentation. Um, but I, am, I, I really can't resist telling you about a new product um, and I'm going to try and draw that very narrow line between telling you about a new product and making it a sales pitch and, because I do want to get invited back. So, XSLT on the browser. Let's start by casting our minds back to an earlier millennium. Not quite as far back as Stonehenge, but to the beginning of XSLT. And XSLT um, became a recommendation in 1999. Um, the work had obviously started a little bit earlier than, than that. And in the beginning, a lot of people thought of XSLT as a technology that would run on the browser. Um, it was well supported by the browser vendors, so well supported that Microsoft jumped the gun and delivered a product that implemented a draft of XSLT, which they then were surprised to find changed considerably before it became a recommendation, um, which um, there's no harm in doing that, but it's a, a little bit unfortunate when you launch that draft implementation as part of a product that's, that, that's got 90% share of the browser market. Um, but they correct, quickly corrected themselves and um, produced a product that did um, have a very high level of conformance to the XSLT recommendation. Um, and then what happened? Answer, not very much. Um, so although XSLT was conceived as a technology for the browser, um, today, one has to say, it's not very widely used. Um, some people would say that XML in the browser is a failure. Some people would even say XML on the web is a failure. Don't let anyone tell you that. Um, what is the web? The web is a vast network of information resources, and an awful lot of those information resources are in XML. So XML on the web is absolutely a success. And that is why we need to support XML on the browser. The browser is not the web. If people tell you that, 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 that XML isn't on the web, they usually mean XML isn't in the browser. And as far as I'm concerned, that means XML doesn't get off the web. It stays on the web and gets turned into something else before you see it. And it's important that those information resources are in XML because they were, they're in XML for a very good reason. They are there because that information will have a far longer life than today's browsers. Um, that information content, we just heard from one of our sponsors about the kind of information that's, that's being managed. And I was talking to Uchi last night about one of the fun things about this community is that we get to talk to a lot of people working in the humanities um, who are dealing with, 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 with information that is centuries and millennia old. And that information is going to be around for a very, very long time, long after Internet Explorer has disappeared and been ground into dust. Um, so, the, so XML on the web is there, it's there for a very good reason, it's going to stay there for a very long time, and, and, and our job um, when we look at the browser is to take the best advantage of it. Um, but XML on the browser has been a failure, and it's important we understand why. We can't just put XSLT2 on the browser and expect it to, to fare better if we don't understand why XSLT1 on the browser wasn't successful. The number one reason why it hasn't been successful is that it hasn't been, at any time in that history, which is a mere 12 years rather than a millennium, um, XSLT on the browser has never been universally available. In the beginning it was available on Internet Explorer, which had, might have had a 90% market share of the browser, but 90%, um, but it, in terms of installed browsers it didn't because at the beginning it was only available in, I don't, can't remember, was it IE4 or IE5 um, that it came out in, but 60% but of the world was still using IE3, 
and, and why shouldn't they? Um, so no one put their, um, no one depended on XSLT in the browser because all those IE3 users didn't support it. And then Firefox came along and other browsers came along and took market share from Microsoft and they didn't support XSLT on the browser initially. And we've only got to the point really in the last couple of years where you can rely on a desktop browser having XSLT 1.0 support. And hey presto, what happened um, in the last couple of years? Um, instead of 95% um, of internet access being from desktop machines, an awful lot of internet access is now from mobile devices and, and, and they don't have XSLT support. Um, so you've never, as a content provider, you've never been in the position where um, serving XML via XSLT, you could reach a sufficiently universal um, proportion of your, your target market. So that's the number one reason. And there have been other reasons. Um, the lack of a consistent JavaScript API for driving XSLT, well, people can get around that. Another major reason, I think, has been, been um, competition from other ways of doing it. A lot, of the, a lot of the perceived benefits of doing XSLT on the browser initially um, were about separating from rendition from content. And a lot of those benefits um, have been delivered in practice through improvements in CSS. So yes, CSS, um, in one level, it's no competition for XSLT um, in that it, it's not nearly as powerful. But at, as a at another level, it takes some of the um, so some of the market away, the people who want to do something simple can now do simple things using um, a, a much simpler technology. And um, JavaScript, the message there is, is really this bottom one. XSLT has been stuck in the world of Web 1.0. What you do with XSLT is you take a static XML page and you turn it into a static HTML page. And then if you want to do anything interesting, you hand over to JavaScript. So you generate an HTML page with JavaScript and all the interesting bits are JavaScript. And so the user, so you have to have JavaScript skills and all the interesting parts of the job are done in JavaScript. So why not do the other bits in JavaScript as well? And why, you know, why learn two languages where, where, where one will do the job? And, and what I hope to do this morning is to, to, to show that um, XSLT in the browser can actually do a far larger part of the, part of the job. Um, it needs to take in, it needs to integrate with X forms, it needs to integrate with Ajax, um, it, it needs to move into the modern world of, of, of modern web applications. So let's roll the clock a bit further forward. Um, round about this conference last year, I think it was becoming clear that there was a lot of interest in doing things on the browser and that we couldn't rely on the browser vendors to do it for us. And a lot of people started saying, if you want to do it on the browser, do it in JavaScript. Um, so the big thing I learned last year um, was, firstly, that waiting for the browser vendors, um, we could wait forever. Um, they weren't interested in XML. Um, they weren't particularly interested in content. They were interested in, in, in glitz and presentation. Um, and the other thing I learned was that um, even though the platform seems very limited, I mean, who would want to write, who would want to use JavaScript as a system programming language? Can you really use JavaScript to write a schema processor or an XSLT processor, a language that doesn't even offer integer arithmetic, let alone bit twiddling? Um, is that what we conceive of as a system programming language? No, it isn't. Um, but the answer is that today's hardware is so fast and there's so much spare processor power on your average, um, on your average device um, that you can use a completely ridiculous language and still get acceptable performance um, in the end. Um, so although JavaScript is, is, is never what we would have designed, just as the QWERTY keyboard is never what we would have designed, um, or XML is never what we would have designed, quite frankly. Um, it's surprising that, that, that our, our adaptability in this industry to, make, to, to, to do wonderful things from unpromising starting positions um, is, 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 is quite amazing. 
Um, so at this conference, a lot of people last year were talking about doing things on the browser as, as something that could be done. We saw a presentation of, of XQuery delivered as a, um, as a plugin. I think a lot of people were saying plugins aren't the way to go. It has to be native, um, and to make it native, it has to be in JavaScript. And then at Balisage in the autumn, um, Wojtek Tomen came along and showed us his implementation of, um, of Xproc running in the browser. And the way that he'd implemented that, um, his, his product Calumet is written in Java. He transported it to the browser by um, port converting it into JavaScript using Google's GWT technology. Um, and I spoke to him at that conference, and he convinced me that um, GWT was far more powerful than I'd imagined it, it might be, and that you could um, convert some pretty sizable Java applications to run in the browser using that technology. And then the next thing that happened in um, 2010, as far as I was concerned, was the um, W3C plenary conference in Lyon in November. Um, where we had some presentations from the, the, the Watt working group um, about all the wonderful things they were doing in HTML5. And that presentation made me really angry. And, and, and that made me get moving. Um, why did it make me angry? Because what they were showing us was television over HTTP. Um, they were showing us a world of entertainment, of glitz, of surface polish, and, and, and no content. Um, it became clear to me why they weren't interested in XML. Um, it's because that's not, not the way they're moving in terms of their market. Um, they're, in the, they're in the entertainment market. They're not, they're, they're not in the serious content business. Um, so I got quite cross about that, and I could, uh, partly just because I could see their point of view. I could see why they weren't moving in the direction that we as a community wanted them to move in. And, and, and that convinced me that because they hadn't got the motivation, and of course they're, they're rational beings, um, they weren't going to do what, 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 what would suit our interests, and therefore we had to do it ourselves. So I wrote a rather angry, angry um, blog posting. I seem to um, remember using the word hunter to refer to the browser vendors. Um, and it had the desired effect. Um, one of the desired effects was that I had a very pleasant morning t talking to Henry Sivonen as we walked to the conference over the park and had a very civilized conversation in which um, um, we discussed the fact that he was behaving rationally and I was behaving rationally and this is what we must do about it, um, which is one of the nice things that happens at an event like that. But I let off a bit of steam and then I came home and decided to do something about it. And what I started doing was doing what Wojtek had done of um, hacking away at my Java code to see if I could get it to compile under GWT. Um, now, Saxon, um, the Enterprise Edition, is a quarter of a million lines of code. The Home Edition is, there are figures in the paper, but if I remember rightly, about 150,000 lines of code. Um, I reckoned that to get an XSLT 2.0 processor in the browser, um, a target should be getting it down to about 40,000 lines of code. Um, which I reckoned was achievable because that's about twice the size of my XSLT1 processor. Um, now, I haven't quite made that yet. I've got it down to 60,000. That's still a big reduction, and it compiles into about 850 KB of JavaScript, um, which, so long as you've got a decent internet connection, actually downloads in an, in an acceptable time. Um, so it works. Um, and what I want to do today is to tell you about it. Um, that's not actually today. If I'll, 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 I'll buy a drink for someone who can tell me which year that picture was taken based on who's present. <laughs> so, I'm calling it Saxon Client Edition. Um, and it's going on alpha release from next week. Um, if you look on our website, sometime during the next week, you'll see download links to it. I won't promise exactly when. Um, so let's show you it. If 
you are an avid reader of my books, you will see that every edition of the book has had a version of the Knight's Tour style sheet, which I use as a demonstration of how to do functional programming in XSLT. Um, but I've always thought it would be quite nice to animate the Knight's Tour. Um, so I did. Um, let's see what we do. We click on a square and the Knight moves around. And if you want to see it move more slowly, we can do that. And if we want to see it move faster, we can do that. Now, the significance of that is that that is all written in XSLT. Um, all the animation, all the handling of the buttons, everything. I'll show you in a moment how that works. Um, the other interesting thing about it is um, that it works in any browser. It's not dependent on the browser vendor to make that work. Um, it's um, there's no user written JavaScript, but as far as the browser con is concerned, it's 100% JavaScript, and any browser that supports JavaScript will run that code. Um, it will even run on the phone. I don't know how many of you can see it. <laughs> but there's the night tour running on the phone. <laughs> So how does it work? Let's show you some code. <laughs> First of all, there's an HTML page. Um, there has to be an HTML page. That's the only way you can start, any, start your JavaScript off. Um, and what I do, you don't have to do it this way. You can generate the whole HTML page that overwrites this using XSLT. But in principle, what I, what I like to do is to use the HTML page as a skeleton for the content, for the fixed content, and then use XSLT to, to populate the variable parts of the content. Um, so we've got a title, and we've got a couple of script elements here. And I make no apology for stealing this idea um, directly from um, the guys in ETH who did XQuery on the browser um, because it seemed like a, a nice way to do it and so I thought I'd steal the idea. Um, so the first script element um, says load Saxon. Um, let's just get that visible. Um, that's loading a standard bit of um, stub JavaScript code um, generated by the Google Web Toolkit. Um, and that actually does browser detection. It says, which browser am I using? And it then loads a different version of the Saxon Java, the main engine, um, based on which browser you've got. And Google Web Toolkit um, automatically generates different versions of the JavaScript code that are optimized to different browsers, and it, and it, and it downloads the, the right one. Um, and then the second line is saying, here's a style sheet. Um, and the style sheet is in tour.xsl. Um, and that's all we need to know at the moment. And then there's a couple of divs. There's a div for the board, and there's a div for the control panel. And the div for the board is empty because the style sheet's going to populate it. Notice it says ID equals board, and that's how the style sheet will refer to it. And then the control panel um, is another div with a bit of rendition, which arguably should, shouldn't be there, but it is. Um, and a couple of buttons on it, and a, a drop down to select the speed. So that's the HTML code. Um, now let's have a look at the XSLT code. Um, most of this is um, the logic to do the night's tour. And I'm not going to concentrate on that because that's old hat and you've all read the book and you all know how that works. Um, and if you haven't, then, then you can buy the book and find out. Um, what I'm going to concentrate on is the, the part that does the, the interaction and the animation because that's new. So we start off with match equals slash in the standard way. And what we do is we display an empty board. And displaying the empty board, we use XSL result document with a magic href like that, which says find the div call with the ID attribute board 
and populate that content with what this result document generates. Um, and I'm using a method replace content, um, which is actually the default, which says over, no, actually the default is to append the content there, um, but method equals replace content will overwrite it. Um, this isn't producing serialized output, this is writing directly to the HTML DOM. Um, so it's doing tree updates on that DOM. And how does that work in terms of being side effect free? Because we can read the HTML as well. The answer is it uses the same kind of architecture as XQuery updates. It does all the retrieval first. It puts the update in a pending update list. And then when, when it's finished reading the input, it processes the pending update list. And that will have a, an instruction to update the contents of that, that section of the result document. So what's it doing? It's producing a grid of 64 squares, and it's giving them each of, an, each of them an ID called square, um, dollar square, where that's the square number, um, and it's coloring them different colors based on something mod 2. Um, and it's giving each square a content which is a, um, a non-breaking space. Um, so it does that, and that's all. It finishes. It goes away. It sits there displaying an empty board. Um, what happens next? The user clicks on something. What happens when they click on something? Um, let's go down to see where we handle the interaction. This is where the interaction happens. So we've got a template rule that matches a square. We know it's a square because its ID starts with the word square. And it's got a mode which is IXSL colon on click. So IXSL is my namespace. Um, I recognize that namespace. IXSL colon on click is um, a mode that gets fired up when the user clicks on something. So when, when the user clicks on a square, um, a transformation is executed with the initial mode being the on click mode and the initial um, node in the document that you're transforming being the node in the HTML DOM that you've actually clicked on. Um, and when you click on it, what it does is it does the first move and goes away. And the first move, sorry, I'm having to page up and down here. Um, I thought I'd improve this for presentation purposes. But the first move um, works out where you've clicked. It displays, uh, it, the empty board is the data structure underlying the, um, the display. Um, which is just an, an array of 64 integers. Um, and it places the knight on there on the square that you clicked on. And it displays the board in that state. And it then um, makes the next move. But it doesn't make the next move immediately. It, it, it waits to do it. And to wait to do it, I've got this extension instruction called schedule action, um, which does whatever's inside the body of it after a certain length of time. And how long does it wait? That depends on the speed that you've selected. And if we go down again to look at that function that selects the speed, what that does is it looks at the HTML page. So there's an extension function which returns the HTML document node. And it um, finds the select element, which is the drop-down list, or it's, the, it's an item in the, in the drop-down list whose name is, is speed. Um, it finds the current setting of that. Um, the setting of a drop-down list isn't available in the DOM as an attribute, but I've made it available as a virtual attribute, as a pseudo attribute, because HTML elements, um, they don't only have, have, have attributes, they also have properties. And the properties are accessible to, to JavaScript, but not via the DOM interfaces. So I've exposed those as virtual attributes in a namespace that you can, you can access using XPath. Um, and specifically, this at prop um, namespace gives you access to the, the, the selected index in that drop-down list. And then it simply selects an interval of either 1,000 milliseconds, 300, or 50 milliseconds, depending uh, whether you selected slow, medium, or fast. And so that's how long it decides to wait. And having waited that long, um, it then um, moves the knight. And that's where we're um, 
not particularly interested in how it computes the next move, um, but having computed it, it shows the next board, and then it moves on. When we when we go to next move, it's I mean, let's go very briefly through the logic. It's finding a list of possible destinations for the night. Um, if there are no possible destinations, um, then, it, then, it, then it gives up and says the night's stuck. There's only actually one starting square where that happens, and I won't tell you which it is. <laughs> um, the original version of this did backtracking. I haven't tried to do the backtracking in the animation. Um, this is actually uh, another way of finding the HTML document. I was experimenting with different interfaces. So one is the extension function IXSL page, and the other is using, using this magic URL for the, for the document. Um, it then finds the best possible destination. Um, it then places the knight at that best destination. Uh, it then prints the board. And then if we haven't done 64 moves, it um, sh again schedules the next move to be done after a certain length of time. Um, and that's basically it. Um, the only other interesting bits are what happens to the buttons. Um, if you click on the stop button, then it actually sets an attribute in the HTML DOM, um, which is they don't allow very much extensibility in the HTML DOM, but one thing they do allow is, is, is you can have your own attributes called data something. Um, so I set an attribute called data something to indicate that it stopped. This da doesn't actually quite work because it doesn't quite track the state of that button correctly. It should unset that state when you click it again the next time. Um, but that's a, a, a little bit of detail in the, the usability. Um, and there's a button called reset, which clears the board. And it, and it does that by writing em empty data back to the board. Um, and we saw the one that, 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 that clicks a starting square. Um, so that's it. Um, that's the animated night tour done without any user written JavaScript. Um, there's one little flaw you might have noticed. Um, given that I started by talking about how the browser vendors were doing TV over HTTP, and that it was all content-free, you might have noticed that there's no XML in this. <laughs> um, which makes a nice demonstration, but rather sort of destroys the point. <laughs> so I thought I'd show you one that has got some XML in as well. Which is much more boring, but, but, but a little bit more realistic. Um, so let's look at the classic old book list. Here's a display of a, a, a list of books. And um, it starts with an XML document, which I won't bother showing you because you've seen a, an XML book list so many times. Um, but books are classified into genres. And what can you do? You can, you can do a few of the usual things. You can decide which genres you're displaying by um, selecting the check boxes. You can sort on any column. And there's a little tool tip that comes up when you come on a column heading. Um, and that's about all. Um, we said we didn't want to spend all day on it. Um, but it's a, a little example, just a few of the interaction effects that people are used to having on the web. And again, that's done without any JavaScript. It's all in, in XSLT. Um, if we look at this one, um, I don't think I'll bother looking at the HTML because it's um, very, very much the same. Well, yes, I will, actually. There's one feature I want to show you about the HTML. Um, what I've done here, and this is um, provisional, is to add an attribute to say where to get the XML from. Now, that's going to change. It's not it's not satisfactory for a number of reasons. One is that you don't want to have a one-to-one -one mapping of HTML pages to XML pages, and I've got to work out how to um, select different XML documents for different instantiations of the, the HTML page. Um, another is that it's, that attribute isn't actually allowed by um, HTML5, um, although, of course, it doesn't object if you use it. Um, and 
The other is that we want to supply a lot more parameters than that. Um, an XSLT 2.0 style sheet can have lots of input parameters, and we want to be able to supply them all. Um, so one thing I've been thinking of doing is, is adding a little um, bit of a sort of um, control, not, not, a, not, a, not a control JavaScript script, but a control script of some kind to control the transformation. Um, I thought of doing that in XML, but for all the reasons that Norm Walsh outlined yesterday, putting, X, putting XML in that document is, 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 is not going to work very well. Um, so although it seems a bit odd to be controlling um, an XML-based system um, without using XML, um, I'm thinking at the moment of putting JSON in that script element um, to provide the parameters for the transformation, which I think will probably in practice be, be, be more usable. Um, but that's, that, that's futures at the moment. It's just um, you can read one particular XML document. And again, it's, it's, it's got divs with IDs that are empty and that get populated um, by, the, um, by the style sheet. And it's got an invisible div which acts as the tooltip, visibility hidden, and activating the tooltip is going to change the visibility of that div uh, and the position of it um, to actually achieve the, the effect that's, that, that's required. Um, so this is what the XSL looks like. Again, there's a match equals slash to start things off. And a result document that writes to the title element and displays the current date. This is just to so that this really is XSLT2, so you've got format date and current date and things like that, uh, just in case anyone thought I was cheating. Um, there are limitations. There's, um, the only language supported is English at the moment. I've got to work out ways of doing other languages without adding to the volume of stuff, so there's got to be conditional downloads for, for the languages you actually want to support. Um, but that's all work in the future. Um, then another result document which populates the books element um, and the interesting thing there is that again it uses a data attribute, an extension attribute to record what genre each book belongs to and we're going to use that later to um, when people click the buttons to show, to select which genres they're actually displaying. Here's a bit of code that shows the genres and it outputs the checkboxes. And initially they're all checked. And now it gets interesting. Here's some code that matches a table heading and shows what happens when you click it. What happens when you click a table heading? It, the table gets sorted. This applies to any table heading. So it's like CSS in that you're, you're defining rules that apply to a, a, a selected set of elements. It's not like you're used to in HTML where you write an on-click attribute for each individual element. You write a rule for a whole class of elements. Only this time, unlike CSS, which just has, has rendition rules for elements, this has behavioral rules for elements that control how, the, how, how that class of elements behave when um, under user interaction. Um, so this does the sort. Um, usual sort of stuff, it, um, it sorts the table. I don't need to go into the logic of that. That's standard XSLT. Um, I guess the only interesting thing here is that it's a, a, another bit of magic in the href element. Um, I may well change the syntax for this, um, but um, you can actually use a, a, a question mark and then an XPath expression to select where you want to put the, the result if you haven't got an ID there. Um, and we haven't got an ID because these things are, are, are you, you don't want to force people to put an ID on every table heading. Um, so it's selecting it dynamically by XPath expression. Again, replace content. And using, again, just to prove it's XSLT2, we've got perform sort to do the, to do the sort. Um, and it's deciding what data type it is um, based on an attribute that we put on the, on, on, on the table heading. Um, if it's numeric, we put data type equals numeric in the heading to ensure that the sort sorted it numerically. Um, so that handles the sorting. Um, what about the tooltip? Uh, well, no, first of all, um, what happens with the checkboxes? 
if you click one of the checkboxes, um, what it does is to change the visibility of the, of the rows. Um, and it's doing that using this set attribute. Um, another bit of magic namespace here. Um, HTML exposes the style properties of an element using the style object, which is itself a property of the element, which itself has properties like, like visibility. Um, we're going to the style properties and again exposing them as attributes in another namespace. So if you want to read the visibility attribute or the left or the or top or any of these other style attributes, you can get, get at them as attributes in a namespace. And so we read the we read the the checked property and if the if if it's true then we use visibility equals table row, which is a bit of CSS that I wasn't familiar with before. Um, but it makes the table row visible, and none makes the, the, the row invisible. So that, that's how rows get, dis get displayed or, or, or hidden based on the checkbox. Um, and then the, the, the tool tip, um, we have two rules, one for mouse over and one for mouse out. And when you do the mouse over, then it um, it changes the position, the left and top, um, of the um, of the the, the tooltip um, that was in the HTML page, um, and again, it's accessing those left and top attributes via this namespace style. Um, and the other thing this reveals is that we're um, getting access to the actual event object in JavaScript um, using another extension function. Um, so that extension function exposes the, the current event objects and allows you to access its properties using another extension function called get. So get allows you to get the properties of any JavaScript object and um, the IXSL colon event allows you to get the, get the event object. Um, and then when the, 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 the mouse leaves the area, we reverse the visibility and, and make the tooltip hidden again. Um, so that's that. Um, before I do the final bit of the talk, um, any questions on how that works? <laughs> You know, I stopped counting, but certainly a dozen decisions about how to bridge the gap. Yeah. And some of those look very straightforward, and some of them, as you said, are uh, you needed to do this, and you made an arbitrary decision, and you'll revisit it. Um, yep. To what extent do you think it makes sense to, at this stage, to document this just in the sense of having a page somewhere that says, here are this dozen things that I had to do to bridge the gap. Mm. These are all things which we need to talk about, you know, because... Um, well, firstly, um, I mean, this is almost the, the next bit of the talk, which is about futures and the way forward. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll try and answer the question. Firstly, I decided this was an area where it was best for implementation to lead standardization. Um, I felt this needed to be explored and investigated and experimented with, and when we found something that works, then is the right time to start talking about standards for it. Um, because I don't know what to, you know, what's going to work and and and, and so on. Um, secondly, um, I've obviously documented what I've currently done and what you can currently use on the product. And when I put the links on the w on the website, you'll find the documentation for these for these current extensions. And yes, it all says they may change in you know the 0.2 alpha release because this is work in progress, as you say. Um, thirdly, I am hoping and planning um, to um, do a paper for a future conference. I hope to get a paper into Balisage that talks about the principles of this and the options and the decisions and the concept of interactive XSLT as a language and how that differs from XSLT as we know it today. Um, so um, I'm hoping to 
do the debate at that kind of level. Um, so I, I hope that answers the question. Well, thank you. Um, any other questions at this stage? Could you place the XSLP port oh, directly inside the, the script? Um, for all the reasons Norm was outlining about um, embedding XML within HTML, I think that's probably not a good way forward. Um, it, it can be done. I'm worried that because the because the because the XSLT typically contains bits of HTML, the browser is going to think, oh, I recognize those elements. I'm going to mangle them for you. <laughs> the way that the browsers mangle the, the, you know, the, 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 the input to create a DOM that's different from the one you thought you were getting. So I think that's probably not a way forward. If they'd given us a nice, you know, a nice way of doing XML islands in, in, in HTML, um, then I would certainly go that way. But, the, but all Norm's task force seems to suggest they're not going to give us that mechanism, so we have to do it in a separate document and read it separately. Michael Sperberg and Queen at the back. Just a, a, uh, a question about the mechanics, I guess. The template you're showing matches on TH in mode IXSL on mouse over. Now, I understand the notion of an initial mode, little though I personally tend to use it, um, but this seems to start with an initial node as well. Um, yeah. How does that, I mean, uh, well, is, they, that, is they, that an obscure they, part of the spec that I I'm, to I'm, be familiar with, or is that an extension? I'm perfectly prepared when necessary to, 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 to stretch the interpretation of the, the, the spec here. I'm not going to be rigidly bound by it. If it stops me doing what needs to be done, then, then, then I'm, I'm, I'm going to go that way because it, because it wasn't written with interactive XSLT in mind. Fair um, enough. But where I can use what the spec um, allows me, then I'm going to use it. And what it does is that you can say a it says you can start a transformation at a particular node in a particular mode. And, and that's okay. what I'm doing so here. This is, that's the way your, uh, your, in, your interface to user interface events works, yeah. is an event fires, you have a mode devoted to the event, you have a template that matches the element that was uh, activated. Hmm. Well, I have to say there's one, one, one point I might make here about the language, which is that um, it gets very fuzzy thinking about what constitutes one transformation. Like where I schedule something to be done in, 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 in 200 milliseconds, is that being done within the same transformation or within a different transformation? Um, it's a bit of one and a bit of the other sometimes. Um, and I'm not quite sure how important a question that is, but I think we're probably going to have to um, pin down questions like that as, as this progresses. Um, so uh, in particular, the, the context of doing pending updates, pending updates that are done at the end of some sort of execution unit, and I'm not currently sure if that execution unit is the same as a transformation in the sense of the, the spec or if it might be something slightly different. George. What about the Contains the TH. Uh, so my question is about the built-in templates in XSLT. If you click on, uh, if you mouse over something that contains the TH, basically the uh, built-in template will say apply templates in the same mode, and the TH will be activated by by that. Um, how how you, do they interact with? It depends partly on the JavaScript model for for cascading and bubbling of events and things, which I have to say I have not fully understood. <laughs> so, but but as far as I, as far as I understand the system, um, if the if the browser engine notifies the event on that node, then this rule will fire. Now, there are all sorts of subtleties about whether an event can, can cascade and bubble up to containing nodes or, or, or that sort of stuff. And, and it should all work because I'm just picking up the JavaScript event. Um, what's actually happening here 
is that Saxon is registering an event listener associated with that HTML node, and the browser engine will then fire that event listener um, based on its own rules for, for, for who gets notified of, of particular kinds of event. Yes, but the built -in, uh, there, there is a built-in template basically in XSLT that matches on a table in the same mode, right? With the IXSL on mouse uh, out. If you click on a table, the, the built-in rules in XSLT will apply the templates further in, on the same mode and the, this will trigger. Right. Basically. Um, so th that was the question. I guess if there's no template rule defined for a table event and on click, then, it, then there's no event listener and so it does nothing, so this will never get fired. Um, so the, the answer is the, the built-in template rules won't get invoked because the transformation won't get invoked. It's in the link between the browser and the... That's right. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's a good point, though. Um, okay, let's try, and, let's try and wrap up. This is, this is um, deliberately fuzzy, um, but where do I see this going? Um, I see it going a lot further than this. At the moment, we're doing very explicit event handling of very explicit mouse events. Um, I think the whole point about XSLT is actually to do things at a higher level than that. So it's a step in that direction, um, but I want to get to a point at some stage where we aren't doing low-level coding of what happens when you do an on-mouse over and an on-mouse out. Um, for a start, I mean, why do you have to explicitly write code to undo the effects of a mouse over when you do a mouse out? You should just say that this is a transient state, the mouse is over this, um, it creates a transient change to the DOM and that gets automatically and The kind of thing you should be able to do in a declarative language is, is, is to get a little bit higher level and less procedural than that and, 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 and associate states with things. A lot, of the, the, um, a lot of the insight for that should come from Xforms. Xforms has gone much further than this in terms of defining a declarative model for how uh, the state of the page changes in response to, to, um, to user input. Um, there's a very interesting question about how this should interact with, with, with XForms, um, but clearly a lot of that thinking needs to come into this, um, that you don't define low-level procedural manipulation of individual events, but a high-level model of, of the, the, um, the interactions and dependencies of different things on the page. Um, so I want it to be more declarative, but definitely interactive. So it, it, it's a declarative model of the interaction. And I include by that not just the interaction on a specific page, but the interaction at the level of um, booking a flight, where you go through a sequence of five pages and you have to manage the history and the back button and all that kind of thing. And there should be a declarative description of that, that entire dialogue, and you don't have to take care of you know, the URLs and the, 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 um, the making, th making the thing bookmarkable and, and whether you use hash or hash pling or um, all that kind of nonsense that, you, that, that currently in programming the browser you have to worry about. Um, we should have a much higher level model of that, 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 um, that, that interaction. Um, localization again should be done much more declaratively. Um, by stateful, I, I, I mean all that stuff about automating the, 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 the management of history in the back button. Um, cloudy, I, li I rather like that word. Um, what I mean by that is, is um, we shouldn't write code to run on the browser or code to run on the server. We should write code. Um, the deployment of which code runs on the client, which runs on the server, should be something that the system um, can, 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 can decide for itself. Um, I think um, technologies like GWT show the way forward in that, um, but they're still, they're, they're still positioned as things running in one place or the other. I think the future is you don't know where the code is running. Um, it might be running in the client, it might be running in the server, the system decides. And a big benefit of a declarative language like XSLT is that it can make that decision and, and you haven't written code that will only work one way rather than the other. Um, so I think there's, a, there, there's enormous potential for a declarative language like XSLT running in the browser. Um, I think the implementations we've seen to date of XSLT 1.0 in the browser vastly 
uh, underexploit that potential. Um, and I think the, the reason that XSLT in the browser has not been a success to date um, is that what people are doing with it is far less than, than, than it's actually capable of. To make a success of it, we're going to have to make it do things that, that are way beyond what you can do with JavaScript today. Um, and I think there's a, a realistic possibility of achieving that. So thank you very much for your time. So thank you very much. So I, I have, we already have one question on, on Twitter, which was uh, if you already had presented this to web developers, but I think the question is very simple. It's the first time you this show this. This is the first time I've exposed yeah, it. You're, so. you're highly privileged. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Uh, is there any questions? Oh, interesting. No? So thank you very much thank again. You. Thank you.